Hi, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of 1st of July 2021. Today, uh, Sebastian couldn't make it. I have the pleasure to co-host you with my uh, friend and colleague Florian Doster from Heriot Watt. We are both uh, pleased and delighted to host you all and also truly honored to host uh, Rafaela Ocone from Heriot Watt University. Rafaela would not need my introduction or any introduction, but still out of courtesy and respect, I'll, I'll read a few lines about her. Uh, she is uh, she is graduated in chemical engineering from the University of Napoli in Italy and obtained her MA, Master of Arts and PhD from Princeton University in US. She holds the chair of chemical engineering at Heriot Watt University since 99. She is a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, the Royal Society of Edinburgh, the Institution of Chemical Engineering, and the Royal Society of Chemistry. This is just outstanding, and I'm really impressed by all these names. In 2007, she was appointed a Cavalier of the Order of the Star of Italian Solidarity by the President of the Italian Republic. In the Queen's 2019 New Year Honours, she was appointed Officer of the British Empire, OBE, for services to engineering. Raffaella was named as one of the top 100 most influential women in the engineering sector in 2019 in the list produced by board appointments firm inclusive boards in partnership with the Financial Times. She was also the first uh, Caroline Herschel visiting professor in engineering at RUHR University in Bochum, Germany between July to November 2017 in recognition of her work, outstanding work in ethics in engineering. Rafaela's main area of research is in the field of modeling multiphase reactive systems with emphasis to the development of responsible technologies in the energy area, uh, arena. Sorry. She was taken the lead in the teaching of engineering ethics. And I can't do any justice to introduce her enough, but I hope that few uh, lines, those few lines gave you already an impression about her. It's just our true honor to host you, Rafaela, today. Thank you for graciously accepting our invitation. To the audience, please note her lecture would last for about half an hour, and then followed by questions and discussions. Like always, please do type, text your question in the chat box. Florian would chair the discussion session, uh, like always. So thank you very much once more, Rafaela. We are all looking forward to hearing your lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Hadi, and uh, thank you to Sebastian and Florian for uh, uh, inviting me and also for chairing the session today. It is really my honor to be here with you and uh, for the opportunity to deliver the, the webinar and also to talk about responsible technology and more generally about uh, engineering ethics. Um, as an engineer, uh, I have been always very much interested in the history of engineering. And some years ago, I came across to the book, which is entitled The Ancient uh, Engineers. The book is quite old now. It was published in uh, 1963, uh, and it's, it is relatively popular. It has been translated in many languages. Uh, it examines engineering through the ages from 3000 BC to 1519 AD. Uh, in other words, from uh, the work of the Egyptians through the speculative inventions of Leonardo da Vinci. And of course, I mean, uh, from my accent, you can understand I'm Italian and I'm extremely uh, proud of uh, being from the same country of Leonardo da Vinci. What I found interesting in this book was uh, the way uh, the author ended it. And you can read what he says. He says that civilization is a matter of power over the world, and, uh, of nature, 
and the skills in exploring this world. And, but it has nothing to do with kindness, honesty, or peacefulness. This was quite striking for me. And then he goes on up to the end when he say, he, referring to the engineer, can hit your house, dam your river, or build your spaceship, but it is hardly fair to expect him also to make you love your fellow man. When I read this, I have to say that I was extremely surprised and also um, uh, couldn't believe that somebody could have written something like that. The only positive thing, if I may, was that he referred to him. So at least there was a positive for my female colleagues. Uh, the book mentioned extensively the work of Leonardo. And this is another thing that I was very surprised about because Leonardo for me represents the quintessential engineer. And indeed, Leonardo already understood that um, in order to do engineering, you have to marry societal needs, creativity, analysis, and uh, scientific knowledge. This is exactly what an engineer should be. When I started to get interested in uh, engineering ethics, I went back to the origin of uh, ethics, of course, and, and I tried to read Aristotle. Now, Aristotle said that uh, ethics is about practical wisdom. In other words, he says that one has to gain practical wisdom, which uh, uh, requires uh, acquiring practical experience. So young people, students, let's say, they can be accomplished in geometry and mathematics, but they are not prudent. Prudence comes with the particulars as well as generals. So in other words, he says that education starts by studying and acquiring particular specific knowledge, but young people learn topics like geometry, mathematics, for instance, but they become accomplished only when they start to understand the societal needs and look at the world and try to avoid risks. In other words, they will, they are prudent. Um, I, I, I believe that this convention that education has to imply universal values is really an important point. And somehow this point, I believe it has been lost during the years, the following years. When I started, uh, to, to study engineering and eventually when I became an academic, I realized that uh, knowledge was really uh, uh, was really contained in silos. And specifically, there was a silos which was engineering and other silos which was social sciences. I moved in the UK in 1995. And at the time, knowledge in engineering was uh, really, like I said, very much uh, technical uh, knowledge. And I was extremely surprised that engineering students could solve technical problems with a confidence that I did not have myself. On the other hand, engineering students rarely were involved in sort of political and social issues that concern the Italian students, for instance, at, at my time. So at first sight, I thought this was absolutely interesting how good that they could really be so technical. And uh, this seems to be almost appealing to me. However, it's also true that if there is a disaster which happened, for instance, the, the engineer is the first to be blamed. Um, I, studying again philosophy, I came across uh, a metaphor introduced by uh, uh, Isaiah Berlin, uh, who, uh, who uh, distinguish people in uh, two categories, fox and hedgehogs. And uh, in other words, engineers at the time were seen like uh, hedgehogs, which looked at the world with a single lens. Uh, in this case, the lens of uh, technical competency. Uh, I hope that in the meantime, things have changed. And I like to think that we are now, as engineers, more foxes. In other words, we are much more interested in looking at the, at the world with, uh, with uh, uh, different, uh, under different lenses. And the same thing 
happens when we start to think about technology, of course. Now, um, when we speak about technology as, an enge as engineers, uh, we, want to, uh, we want really to understand what we mean by technology. And I, I wrote in 2020 an a, um, editorial for the Energy and the AI Journal, where I was exploring questions like, what is really technology? Do we need to classify technology? Um, how we consider a technology being trained? and how can we intervene when we are developing technology in the event that, of course, what the, 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 the results does is not exactly what we like. Now, in an attempt to classify the technology, this is one uh, graph that shows you how the technology, technological innovation proceeds towards steps, starting from research and development, production, marketing, diffusion into the society. If all the steps are um, achieved and are uh, um, obtained, we have entrenched technologies. But of course, there may be emerging technology when they are still at the research and development stage. Now, uh, please note this because I will go back to emerging technologies. And of course, you can classify the entrenched technology like standalone, disrupting, incremental, enabling, pervasive, and so on. Now, a full developed uh, technology, of course, as products, uses, regulations, and social impacts that are already in existence. They are already out there, and the end users uh, adopt them. Um, I reflected about the 24th centuries, which is the century where we are. And uh, uh, this is just my personal analysis. In the first decade, I think that we looked at many technologies which were co were considered converging technologies and uh, it is extremely important i will uh, discuss a little bit this later that there was a a, a, a report uh, where uh, uh, the converging technologies were presented as those technologies for out there for improving human performance. And they were essentially nanotechnology, biotechnology, information technology, and cognitive science. In the second decade, uh, the sustainable development goals came about, and with those also emerging technology. The third decade is our decade, is where we are living at the moment. And uh, there is a lot that we need to do about responsible technology. I believe that this responsible technology comes naturally as a consequence of what happened in the first and in the second decades of the 21st century. Uh, I put in the parenthesis transhumanism there because if uh, you want to have a improve the performance of human being, probably this is what, where we could uh, tend. But this is just something which I don't want to um, say in much details at this, at this point. Now, uh, like I, I said, uh, the converging technology for improving human performance uh, uh, were uh, are, are in a report which is extremely relevant. Uh, it was commissioned uh, in 2002 uh, by the US National Science Foundation and the Department of Commerce, Commerce and the report contains description um, and the commentaries of this, on the state of science and technology looking at the combined field of nanotechnology, biotechnology, information technology, and cognitive science. The first important point to, to look there is that cognitive science is considered to be a technology. Uh, potential uses of this technology for improving health and uh, overcoming disability are discussed, but also the report discussed the application of human enhancement technologies in the field of militaries, in the military sector. And, uh, and then there is the rationalization between the human machine interface in industrial settings. So extremely high ethical issues here that I think as engineers, we should be aware of. Uh, all this, of course, brings me to, 
to, to, to, to discuss about morality and hence ethics. Uh, those technologies are a different stage of that techno uh, technological development and uh, sometimes they are emerging. And this is extremely important because they modify our world the environment, but also the human being. And this is exactly where we, as engineers, we need to intervene. Uh, and then again, uh, just a provocative thought here about transhumanism. Now, um, I, I gave a lecture in at the beginning of 2020, just before the pandemic. And uh, I was in China, actually, in Tianjin, and I had this slide here. Uh, at the time, all the different bullet points were blue. Uh, now I have extracted climate emergency, energy transition, and security in green, just because these are the ones that are more of concern for the series of this webinar. And one thing that I would like to point out is that at the time, there was no idea that we were about to have a pandemic. So. For me, pandemic was not there. Of course, I mean, now pandemic is just at the top of those challenges for our decade. And, uh, and I think that what I really would like to stress here is that although these challenges seems to be separated, indeed, they are absolutely linked. And uh, we have uh, to look mainly at the system approach and working very closely with policymakers and consider diversity, inclusion and training if we really want to solve these challenges. And of course, this applies to climate emergency and energy transition and security as well. Um, as I said, they are these are global humanitarian challenges. However, uh, another important point that I would like to make here is that although these, these uh, um, challenges are global, we need to have uh, an individual responsibility to solve them. And uh, more importantly, we need to embed diversity, inclusion in all and inclusion in all these uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, what I mean here is not necessarily a, di a diversity in terms of gender. I mean diversity of ideas and approaches. And we should really be able to include also ethical considerations in all these, in all these um, um, development goals. Uh, we should also train engineers in such a way that they look for solutions uh, that address ma major societal challenges. For instance, climate change will affect the poor um, uh, and will be related to, to, the, to the sustainable um, goal, which is about poverty um, and will affect food security. And of course, I mean, there is underneath all the digital skills that we will need to teach to our uh, students in an inclusive manner so that all the benefits for change and, in, and innovations can be evenly distributed and more importantly, just. Um, to go back to climate change, uh, one thing that probably we don't realize is that uh, there is a huge ethical uh, issue in a climate change already. And this is in the, tra in the energy transitions. This is because uh, AI are already used uh, for instance, in enabling smarter decisions making for decarbonizing industries and transportation, understand how to allocate renewable energy and so on. But there are ethical concerns that will become more relevant uh, when, uh, for instance, people start to think about that the machine learning technology will imply public surveillance, intentional misuse of data, privacy, transparency, data bias that can lead to discrimination and inequality. So if uh, uh, we, we, we start to think about the energy 
transition and we start to think about how energy can be distributed, the use of the data can bring to bias that can bring people to, to have, for instance, uh, energy poverty. And these are things that, again, we will need to address as an engineer. At this point, uh, it results clear to me that uh, engineers and technologists would need to study ethics. Uh, however, uh, there is a very big difference between engineering and philosophy. In engineering, uh, ethics is not moral philosophy. Um, and uh, um, this is because philosophy is about analysis. And this is the new philosopher. It's not the old philosophers who lived really very much in a symbiosis with uh, the environment. Uh, the new philosopher wants to understand an ethical problem and discuss the theory, comparing different applications and different approaches. The engineer on the other side is about synthesis. So engineers will find the solutions to ethical problems. In other words, the best course of action. And this is fundamentally different, fr different from a philosopher. The engineer himself or him themselves, I should say, uh, they are embedded in the process. They are prepared for dealing with specific kind of ethical problems and that arise in a real practical situations. This is a very important point. So the ethical dilemma arise like, a, like a, uh, the, the, the very regular way for engineers to work. Uh, and ethics then is in the context of making practical decisions. This brings us uh, to the consideration that probably uh, engineering is very similar to medicine in this, uh, in, for what is concerned with ethics. However, again, there is a very important difference here because medics have a one-to-one -one relationship. They know the patient and the patient sign a consent. So medics have responsibility to an individual. Engineers very often uh, have less human relationship with uh, uh, the clients, let's say. However, they have much more long-term and distributed impact for, in, with, them, with their decisions. Think about a, a bridge, for instance, if the bridge has not been designed properly and the bridge collapse, many more people will die, but the engineers not necessarily know the people that will die. And that that disconnect between the one-to-one -one relationship, again, makes engineering quite different from, from uh, medicine. And then, of course, in engineering, the ethical problems are much harder to detect and best course of action is much more difficult to identify. In order to find a way in, in the very difficult uh, uh, ethical uh, arena, uh, many institutions have, actually all institutions have their code of conduct and uh, uh, the Royal Academy of Engineering has tried to devise uh, four principles that all the engineers should, um, uh, should comply with. And these principles are more a, a guide towards our profession. Uh, ho however, I have to say that things sometimes are not so easy. And, uh, um, respons uh, and for instance, uh, if you think about being respect for life, law, and public good, it depends also very much. It's a very general um, uh, example, a very general principle where one can... Uh, uh, can more or less consider many different things that happen in practice, but doesn't solve really the, the ethical dilemma that sometimes we might have. Um, the, old, the other important point is that so far in engineering, we have always done a so-called post, a posteriori analysis. In other words, we have looked at some uh, uh, events, uh, sometimes uh, disasters, a chemical plant that explodes, a 
some uh, an airplane which 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 uh, crashes, and uh, based on previous data, we are trying to make uh, uh, to make decisions for the future and to make sure that we have uh, the safety and the ethical issues approached. So ethics is in the context of make, making again these practical decisions based on the experience from the past. And when we go to the entrenched technology, of course, I mean, we can look at what the technology delivers, and then this can lead to a better informed ethical evaluation for their use. Um, however, I think that it is time now, especially with uh, uh, all the uh, digital revolution, that we start to do an a priori analysis to ethics. In other words, I think that we have to find solutions to ethical problems making use of speculative data. Because as I said, we cannot predict or we can start to predict what some data can make can can uh, do to us and then based on the speculation of what the consequences can be we should start to have uh, 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 research in uh, uh, redeveloping the technology redirect the, the, the technology and possibly to do that on basis of ethical assessment. So ethics actually can be part of the design itself and can help the stage of the technology when it's still at the, at the emerging st uh, state just to develop in a way that will be fair and uh, just for everybody. Now, uh, in the emerging technology, things that we have to ask ourselves is that, you know, many ethical issues, ethical implications, uh, should we should intervene as soon as possible. We should use, like I said, speculative scenarios and, 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 and think what this can bring to us. But there are also, there is also the personal aspect here. And what does responsibility in emerging technology does to me as a professional? So the engineer who is always very much uh, um, acquainted to work with uncertainty um, has to really uh, be able to, to work with this uncertainty in predicting the future in a way that the, the, the technology that they develop will be fair and just, as I said. In a way, we have already done this in uh, when we do risk assessment uh, in our uh, safety uh, assessment, for instance, in our lab. And we have to be sure that we are able to manage the risk. Now, going back to briefly to to the uh, the climate change uh, it's a, it's a series of different it's not just a technological fix it's of course a technological fix but it's also an attitudinal fix it is also an ethical fix and I, I and i will i will show you what i mean by that and at the end of the day it's it's about our our uh, our behavior um the 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 ethical fix uh, I can I can give you a very very simple example, and I go back to an example which uh, happened actually many well not many years ago but in 2003, and it was just because I don't want to refer to anything which uh, is happening right now. So in 2003 there was a very bad heat wave in Europe, uh, and in France the reactors in land had to go down in had to shut be shut down or uh, go down in their power, the nuclear um, uh, reactors, just because the water that was received to, for, uh, uh, for uh, um, cooling uh, the reactors was already too, 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 too warm. Uh, so under exceptional circumstances, the French government relaxed the regulation to maintain the supply, um, to maintain the supply of electricity, saying, in other words, that warmer water could be used. In the following, this became a permanent measure in, during the summer months. So they relax the regulations, but relaxing the regulation causes thermal pollution that reduce the ability of aquatic exosystem to adapt to warmer temperatures. And there was a human cost too. 
um, in France was not such a big problem. Why? Why? Because people in France were asked to save energy and also to export less energy to other countries. France, of course, uh, relies ma ma uh, mainly on uh, uh, electricity from nuclear sources. They avoided the blackouts. But other countries, like, for instance, Italy, did not. So, in other words, the exports were reduced and uh, they were counted many deaths, about 40,000 deaths, half of which in Italy just because it was too hot and they couldn't cool the, the, the houses. So, as you can see, a very simple decisions about using warmer um, warmer uh, uh, water or to reduce energy consumption can result in very big issues for the population. Um, another thing that we have done very recently, and I have to give the credit to one of my previous students, Nicole Payne, She's a, she was an undergraduate. She did her final uh, MNG research project ahead of what? Uh, and uh, she uh, ran a survey to look at the decarbonizing the sector, the energy sector. And these are the questions that you can read from yourself that she, she was looking at. And uh, the results are, uh, um, are in this graph here. But more importantly, these results that um, are about more policy required, more accountability required, uh, more trust in research than government and so on. I think that can are very much uh, um, uh, represented in this diagram here. And you see that uh, there is the perception that decarbonization is not important as COVID pandemic. The stakeholders are the ones that you can see on the top, and these are the people that were asked uh, the questions, and that uh, you can see the distribution here uh, saying that mainly that decarbonization, yes, is important, but not so important like the pandemic. And uh, there was one of the comments saying that exactly decarbonation important, but not urgent. And I think that, again, we have to make sure that the perception is right. It's just because there are different time scales and because there is an issue about accountability. So it is not easy to admit the effect of a crisis. And this is another point that I would like very much to reflect on. So the conclusions from the survey were that 73% believe that individuals are not held responsible for controlling their own pollution. And 95% strongly agree or agree that everybody should be entitled to energy and electricity. You can see that, you know, you can read the other, the other bullet points, but you see that they are, for each bullet point, many, um, um, ethical issues will come about because advantages and disadvantages, for instance, what are not going to be shared equally between citizens of the UK. We did this survey in the UK. And only 10% uh, strongly uh, disagree or disagree that th they don't benefit from the transition in comparison to other citizens. So these are important points. One academic teacher, and I was really surprised by this, I said, I don't believe in the climate crisis. And this was horrible. And, and then this brings me to the very last uh, thing that I want to talk uh, about, and it's about education and skills. We need to educate our engineers. We need to learn what are the social, the social issues in our engineering work. And this will help students to identify the social element of what they do, uh, understanding the nature of our profession, address problem when the, the practice is questionable, and also have more skills like good judgment, understanding practical difficulties, and develop the ethical uh, identity that we have to carry in all our working life. And there are many ways to teach. Of course, I mean, as a, as a, as a teacher, uh, I want to incorporate the social aspect of engineering in everything that I do, every single technical ma matter that I teach. And I want to use case studies. I want to involve 
philosophy, sociology, politics. And then it is extremely important that we invite practicing engineers to speak because we have to aim at developing the skills more rather than teaching the rules. Um, so there are many opportunities here for accelerating the pace. We have we need more synergetic effort, more diversity of ideas and skills, more support for reskilling and retraining. Think about all the oil and gas workers that would need to be reskilled and retrained, and more opportunity for being flexible. Really, the pandemic finally, this is my final recommendation, has really shown us that we can accelerate the pace, and this is. What what we have to do in engineering. We, we have developed a vaccine, we have uh, done ventilators challenge in no time, and this is what we have to do also in a climate change. So I think that I have taken just a couple of minutes, more than half an hour, but with this, I would like to thank you for uh, listening to me, and I will leave you with the message that somebody said, being a good engineer transcends by from engineering itself. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for this extremely exciting and also engaging uh, lecture. We have plenty questions already uh, posted oh, and good. there will be more to come as well. So without any further ado, I give it to Florian. If there was time, we also ourselves have plenty of questions as well. So Florian, <laughs> please. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, thank you, Rafaela. Also uh, from my side, and um, this is indeed a, um, a a challenging moderation as um, the questions are uh, coming in and are really diverse. And you touched upon so many aspects in your yes. talk that um, grouping uh, the uh, uh, grouping the questions in any meaningful uh, uh, sense i apologize already I, I i'm not up for that job so um but in order to keep things um a, a, a bit simple so the first question by yu hang wang is relatively specific so i'll uh, buy myself some time uh, by uh, launching that question first so uh, thanks for the great talk would you share your idea about what is the most challenging issue that we are facing in the uh, energy transition especially from the engineering perspective okay so for i think that well <laughs> there is not just a single challenge i think the most important challenge is just to make sure that we um we are honest with the transition uh in other words what i mean honest we cannot switch all in gas tomorrow this is this is for sure and we have to make absolutely certain that we don't look from our point of living in a very in a developed country uh, we have to make sure that we embrace and we are uh, aware of what is going on in other countries, in developing countries, where probably oil and gas are still needed. So this is the first challenge. But of course, as engineers, we have the challenge to make uh, um, things, a technology more effective, more efficient, and of course, to contribute to the mix. There will be a need for... Uh, completely exclude oil and gas from the mix. And this will happen, but it's not going to happen tomorrow. So we have to make sure that we have all the technology which are just fair, accessible to everybody. It can be very good mix, like different things, like solar, uh, wind, um, hydrogen, you name it. But we have to make sure that in doing the transition, we are very fair and just. I believe. Thank you. So, like, uh, since you already touched upon oil and gas, Willemain van Reuchen, I hope that's close enough, um, uh, also mentioned, thank you for the nice presentation. And then in some universities, some believe we have to cut all our ties with oil and gas companies. And she has a follow-up question. Do you agree with this or propose an alternative path perhaps to work with them to get their support for the energy uh, transition? Um, uh, I strongly believe that it's absolutely wrong to cut all the ties with oil and gas companies. And I'll tell you why. 
because they are the first one who are interested in the transitions. They are the ones to work with towards the transition. They have to survive. And for surviving, they have uh, to go through the transition. So we should not avoid to work with them. Actually, we should work with them towards the transition. And we, we can learn a lot from them and they can learn a lot from us. So absolutely um, against cutting all the ties with oil and gas. Very good. So um, let me switch gear a little bit and uh, come back to a second question that Yuhang Wang has asked. So suppose we all want to introduce an ethics course for geoscience students or engineering students. What topics uh, should that course cover? Okay. Um I didn't go into the details of what I believe in teaching ethics. I think that should not be a course. If, okay. you are very, if you are very keen, you can have a course. I can tell you what I would put in a course. But personally, I think that we should not have a course. We should rather embed ethics in each course that we do. Uh, in other words, uh, take, for instance, uh, a design project or, uh, um, I don't know, any, any course in geoscience, actually also about uh, enhanced oil recovery or whatever. You can, I think that there are ethical issues in everything we do. Even in mathematics, there are ethical issues. And uh, my ethical issue in mathematics is that we teach engineers that there is always one solution. So look for open problems, look for uh, dilemma that you can have uh, in each thing that you teach. Um, why do you want to extract oil in this, um, in this uh, area? And what do you need to do to have the permission to extract the oil? Uh, and uh, you need to, um, to give something to the local authorities if you are in a country where that is uh, allowed. Is that going to be bribery? Uh, because that is for us bribery, but it might be not bribery there. So what would you do? Would you, um, would you behave as you behave in your country or will you, will you behave like in the country where you are operating? So, so try to um, instill in the students the ethical thinking like we do with environmental issues or safety. So don't do a course in ethics. However, if you are very keen of doing a course in ethics, I would do case studies. So in other words, I would devise a, a role play case studies where students can identify themselves with the engineer, with the politician, with the user and so on, and try to have them to, 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 to play the role. So, so have case studies, possibly real case studies that always happen in industry. So that's what I would do. So I'm, I'm trying to um, like kind of take a bit of a flavor from uh, the questions here and also mix it a bit um, with my opinion or my question to try to uh, make it as uh, um, a bit more lively, uh, more interactive and also uh, uh, yeah, I, I feel I have to challenge you here a little bit <laughs> on, 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 on are we, and uh, as we, I mean uh, the educators in uh, math, engineering disciplines are able to uh, raise the, like uh, you, you summarize quite a bit under ethical constraints, but like ethics, uh, uh, like, if we start like, okay, we do co we teach coding, we don't need a coding class, we, we just weave it into uh, our um, everyday lectures, um, we, we would maybe uh, um, overwhelm the students and uh, we would like uh, lecture A starts t uh, teaching Fortran, lecture uh, B starts teaching are and um, the, the the students might get confused because like uh, like somehow we are in for the greater good but what is the the greater good in 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 ethics like kind of um, 
Well, uh, the great good in ethics is that do the right things even when nobody's looking at you. Uh, so that's that's the great thing, but uh, yeah. the good thing. But uh, that's not the point. I don't think that there will be a confusion because uh, I think it's just a matter of uh, the way we start to train the students from day one. Um, and you know why? Because you know, uh, health and safety, it's embedded. I mean, you don't. Uh, um, you don't confuse the students if they come to your class and you say, well, in order to go to the lab, you have to do a risk assessment. And then you have to look at what are the, uh, the, the risks associated with that particular lab. If they come to my lab, I might have a different risk assessment or there might be another safety issue for what I do. And students are aware of that, so they don't get confused. So what I'm trying to say is that it has to be more a way of behaving and always asking what I'm doing uh, is uh, at the end as an end user, which is who are the people? And uh, how am I affecting the people with my work? So I think that if we insert the social consideration in all the technical stuff that we teach, they will not be confused. So um, I don't think that, to be honest with you, students are more, much more adaptable than we are. <laughs> I have developed, I have, uh, it is incredible because when I started to teach ethics, uh, at Harriet Watt, and I had a couple of lectures who, which were very much about the code of conduct and a couple of examples. Um, at the beginning, students were not very engaged, but uh, in more recent years, students are extremely engaged. And this year, uh, my projects, research projects on ethics, were the ones that were the most popular ones because students are aware about climate change. Uh, are aware about energy problems. And I think that they want to be part of the solution. So I don't. I think that they would love to, to have ethical considerations, to be honest, and they will not be so confused. Um, yes, yeah, so let me uh, just uh, pr uh, bring in here uh, Lila's um, uh, comments. Uh, so like uh, maybe um, navigate a bit more through ah, that. So that that's, thanks that's, for the nice uh, talk. What if can, ethical can be tightly connected with culture and in some cases be uh, in uh, conflicting situation and then the next like choosing between two cases with pros and cons for each with no clear ethical and non-ethical boundaries. So that's maybe uh, I should have shared that a bit more. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think I think this is an extremely, extremely good point, uh, uh, Leila, actually. Uh, and here I should make the decision, the, the, the distinctions between uh, ethics and morality. Uh, what, it's like when we do multi-scale modeling, morality is at the micro level. It's what I believe and it's uh, what I grew up with. It comes, my morality comes with my teachers, my parents, my religion, my environment. But then it comes ethics, which is how my morality interfaces with the outside world. So now you have to be careful here because uh, something which can be moral for me cannot be no morally at the, uh, in another country. For instance, uh, I grew up in Italy, and uh, if you don't help your your um, uh, friend, you are considered to be a bad person, which means that cheating in exams is not so bad. It's actually helping your friend, okay? You come to the UK and cheating in the exam is a, a very bad thing, like it should be. Um, and then you see the difference now between uh, personal belief and ethics, the, the outside world. So one of the things that we have to make sure is that we consider that we are not all from the same culture, 
This is why I was speaking about diversity, that we have different upbringing and we have to factor in that. So this is why we have the, the, the ethical dilemma. There is not a, a right answer. So each one will decide based on the fact that they make the best decision based on the constraints that they have and in what they believe. I mean, I would never pay somebody to give me the authorization to mine something in Africa because I consider it bribing. But for the local people, that is not bribing. So I personally wouldn't do it because it's my morality, but I cannot judge another person in Africa that will do it because that is what you do in that circumstance. And you grew up saying that this is not actually bribing, but it's actually um, give a present for helping you to do your business. So, so, so you know, I think that that's why it's not so easy to, to have a, a white or black conclusion to all these issues but uh, so let me come back on my challenge <laughs> um, so the the fact that you had to like you've been uh, spending a decade or uh, more on uh, uh, thinking about ethic uh, ethical issues in engineering and then you had to define morality against ethics and so on isn't that asking for at least a uh, like introductory course in in a philosophy uh, like ethics philosophy to to at least um establish the foundation what questions we can ethically address uh, like kind of to establish a language to to delineate um Moral uh, from ethics from you're a good negotiator, Florian. You're trying your best. Uh, yes, yes. I I think Florian, I think in a way uh you are right. I think that you know a little bit of introduction would be necessary because you would need to define what is ethics, you would need to understand what is the ethical dimensions, you would need to define morality. Uh, and uh in 10 years I got uh, very much interested and I read uh, Kant and I read Aristotle but just because I loved it but no I'm not saying that engineering students should do that however I think that I have done this in my lectures and then in the two hours I can distillate the important issues and give these examples about ethics and morality and then when you put them in the um, arena of multi multicultural uh, students it's 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 very easy to 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 make them understanding what you mean and you know i was giving case studies for instance just to see how morality and ethics can uh, interface with each other so i think you need a little bit of introduction but examples work much better with with the engineering students so if you can give examples they work much better so we don't need to train uh, the students first, but we definitely need to train the lecturers first. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the, yes, yes. In fact, in fact, when we started about uh, more than 10 years ago, the only reason why I did it, because nobody wanted to do it. And it's like, oh, no, I don't want to do it. So you do it. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, I think that there is definitely a need for, uh, for the teacher to be trained. And indeed, if you, it's a, it, it was not made up. That was a real, uh, um, it was a real combat in our uh, survey that, you know, I don't believe in uh, in uh, in a climate change. So mm. if the teachers do not believe in climate change, this can be transferred to the students, and that's something which, well, I don't want to give judgments. It's not ethical to give judgments, but we have to think about uh, educating the educators. I have another lecture about educating the educators. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, very good. Next year, then, Hadi, yes, uh, yes, take absolutely. note. Absolutely. So, we'll take you on that. Yep. So, so let me uh, go back. Uh, I could 
keep on uh, <laughs> discussing with you, Raphael, forever. But um, let me go uh, back uh, to the questions. And Kishan Kumar asks, uh, thank you for your talk. What is your opinion about upcoming uh, technologies which might be harmful to society but could potentially save many more lives and, uh, and the ecosystem, for instance, uh, geoengineering? Huh. Well, that's that's a that's an unfair question because it's not ethical for me to say which one I would save. Uh, I think that you know, uh, I I I I don't think that we should have uh, technologies that should be harmful. To be honest, um, although I believe that you cannot stop the technology. Uh, technological development. So we should develop all the technology which we can develop. I believe that it's matter very much of uh, regulations. So I think that harmful technology should be regulated. So they couldn't go uh, out there um, like uh, they are, despite people can develop that. Uh, and this is true in medicine as well, stem cells. I mean, uh, nobody wants to stop people by developing, by do all the research on stem cells. Their use should be regulated. Now you can have the corollary question, who regulates them? Are the policy makers, are the politicians up to their job? I don't want to comment here, but you see that uh, engineers should also worry about the policy and how their technology can be misused in some cases. So I don't know, we... probably I have not really answered the question. That was too difficult to answer. I, I went around the question. Anyway. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, let me pick up on that. Um, the, the, uh, does that mean we also need to have politics in engineering? Mm -hmm. so, uh, uh, not uh, politics, or, but or, or policy, politics, policy. Policy, policy, policy. I think it's not politics, it's policy. Um, yeah. I think that uh, it is a... It is bad that engineers not go into politics, I think, uh, and uh, they don't go into policy make. Uh, so yes, I think policy maker make, making should, should policy should go into engineering absolutely. So um, and, and that um, uh, brings nicely in the uh, question by Alexandros Danilidis. So. Uh, <laughs> How much room is there for ethics and morality to play a role in a world that is mostly fueled by uh, profit? I hope, I hope that there is room. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, Alexandros, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I like to be a little bit um, uh, optimistic. Uh, but uh, you might be right that, you know, profit is always there, but I think that there is room and I have huge uh, faith in the next generation and in the students that we are uh, training. I think it's up to us if we really believe in ethics and morality to make sure that we to give the good examples and to train the next generation, I believe. I hope so, at least. It's my hope. I guess all ours. Um, yeah. So uh, David E asks another qu uh, a question. It's a two uh, point question. So thanks for the great presentation. Your student survey shows that 95% feel that everyone should have access to energy and electricity. And then the next point, do you think that the current drive for global energy transition takes into consideration the urgent needs of the developing nations. Uh, I, I, unfortunately, I don't think that uh, we are considering very seriously the needs of uh, the de developing nations, to be honest. Uh, because I, I think that, you know, uh, one fact is sure, we would need energy. I mean, so to cut everything, it's not an option. Uh, but the access to energy if uh, we go our way, might be limited to, to, to developing uh, countries. And I think that it's completely unethical. It's unethical also because we did 
pollute the world in the first in the first uh, instance. Uh, I mean, uh, we started the, the industrial revolution. We have mm -hmm. produced the majority of the CO2, which is around there. Uh, and uh, it's unethical to, to stop the energy consumption in countries that would like to have, uh, that would need for uh, developing a, a life which is uh, more at our standard. So that is absolutely unethical. Uh, so, so, yeah. Uh, it's it's a difficult one yes thanks so so um along that line is the question or like i see a line let's see if you see a line there too uh kunal sulek uh, uh writes post 20, uh, 2008 the global economic crisis the collective focus was on economic uh, recovery recovery or development mm -hmm. so uh, do you have an opinion on how will pan uh, the pandemic situation affect collective consciousness with respect to climate action um, well uh, I hope that I'm wrong but I believe uh, that the pandemic has slightly shifted the uh, the action uh, for climate, I mean, I slightly shifted the, the concerns about a, a climate um, crisis. And this is absolutely wrong, I think. Um, and uh, um, I think that probably it is time now uh, to think that uh, we have to do something about climate despite the pandemic or because of the pandemic. Because I believe that... Um, we have seen huge disruption from the pandemic. Climate can be, bring even worse disruption. And the important point, as one of my students said, Nicole said, there is no vaccine for climate change. There is a vaccine for pandemic, but there is not a vaccine for climate change. So we have to act now despite or just because there is a pandemic it, we we realize that we need to when there is an emergency our life changed completely we don't want to have a life changed forever so we have to act now i believe gloria maybe the last burning um, i was about to uh, i was about to close okay. anyway great <laughs> excellent so, wow. Uh, wow. Okay. can i add just one little thing Please. Um, I think that for all the great questions that I had, uh, engineers, geoscientists, scientists in general, are extremely good in discussing ethics and morality. So I never had so many questions when I presented well. my technical stuff. So <laughs> this, shows, this shows that we are really ready for ethics, morality, and uh, responsible technologies in what we do, I believe. We certainly do relate to these subjects very easily. That's right. Very good. Thank you very much, Florian. If I get the back this stage, uh, I'd like to first thank uh, all the audience for the great questions and the lecture, Florian, as well. Uh, I'd like to take the chance and introduce our next week as speaker. Uh, we will host uh, Professor Saman Ariana from the University of Wyoming in U.S. Uh, Saman will uh, give a lecture about transport of uh, CO2 in the subsurface. So we'll speak about CO2 storage in the subsurface formations. Until next week, 8th of July, stay happy, healthy, and tuned in to our channel. And we all see you again next week with another geoscientific and geoenergetic talk. Thank you, Rafaela. It was our true Thank pleasure you. and honor. Thank you, Rafaela. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you to you. the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.